Hello everyone, welcome to Web Information Systems class. Um, so in previous classes, you have learned how to do uh, server-side programming, client-side programming. You have learned uh, PHP, HTML, CSS. So now you know how to build a website. So if you are one of the lucky ones, you build a website and your website becomes more and more popular and uh, more and more users start visiting your website. Okay, and then at that time, you need to solve the scalability problem. And today we're gonna talk about um, what are the popular patterns people apply to tackle these challenges. So first, we'll start with uh, what is uh, scalability. So scalability, to put, to put it in a simple way, say now if your website has uh, 100 active users and uh, it gets more and more popular and the next month you have uh, 10,000 active users and uh, after two more months you probably have say 100,000 users. So as you, your uh, user base keeps growing and uh, what do you do to make sure that your uh, website is able to handle the growing uh, user base and it can keep providing services to the larger and larger user base. So let's start with a few scenarios first. So the first one is a million users are trying to load the front page of Wright State University. We know that uh, the, there is a limitation on the maximum number of connections uh, a server can handle, right? If we have a million users trying to load the front page of uh, Wright State University at the same time, and then obviously you know one machine cannot do the job. And the next one is um, a million users are trying to submit read queries uh, to the same database. So all these uh, uh, users, so they are competing the resources among the the database, the, the database. And the third scenario is um, a million merchants are writing credit card transactions into the same database. So there are a lot of uh, concurrent uh, uh, write queries going on in the same database. So can one database handle such a a uh, large uh, volume of write queries. And the last one is, uh, say, if you have a image um, sharing a website, and as you keep attracting more and more users, the total size of uh, uploaded pictures by your uh, users is about to uh, exceed the disk capacity on the server. And then what do you do? So first, uh, I will introduce uh, two, um, two, uh, two broad approaches. So the, the, first, uh, the first broad category is called scale up. So scale up is, uh, if you want to uh, handle the scalability uh, challenge, you spend some money to purchase a more powerful so uh, server to replace the existing old server and since the new server is more powerful and then it can handle uh, more services it, it can handle more uh, user requests so this approach is very easy uh, for application development because you don't need to change the logic in your application and you're still dealing with the you know one machine so that is uh, Part one, uh, part two is there is always uh, some physical limitations on server specifications. So it is not the case that you keep throwing money and you can always get uh, more and more, uh, uh, say, CPUs and larger and larger RAM, right? So there is always some limitation on the capacity uh, of one single machine. Uh, another thing is uh, this approach is usually uh, more expensive because we are staffing uh, a lot of um, components 
and making them more and more powerful uh, into one machine. So the other approach is called scale out. So scale out is also called horizontal scaling. So instead of purchasing um, one more powerful machine, uh, instead instead what we do is we purchase uh, more uh, servers, and we organize these servers to form a distributed system. So because now. Uh, we need to change the, the logic in your application because instead of dealing one machine, now you need to deal with uh, multiple machines, and uh, these machines may need to you know, talk to each other. So because of this, the development becomes more uh, complicated. So uh, that is the downside. But at the same time, it becomes more scalable because if so, let's say if you um, if your if your design is um, proper, then say when you double your uh, user space, right? What you need to do is you just simply double uh, your uh, number of uh, servers, and as you keep growing your uh, active user base, you just keep purchasing more and more servers, then uh, connect them together, and uh, you know then you can handle uh, more and more uh, traffic. So this way it is relatively cheaper because instead of purchasing very uh, powerful uh, servers, you can purchase some ordinary servers and uh, then you can put them together. They become a powerful distributed system. So in the rest of this uh, class, I will be uh, discussing some popular patterns that people apply to tackle uh, scalability issues. And all of these patterns they uh, belong to the scale out uh, category. So the first one is called um, load balancing. So if you look at the, uh, the figure on the bottom right, so here we have a bunch of uh, clients, right? And at the bottom we have uh, server 1, server 2, and here server n. Okay. So now we have a uh, different uh, clients trying to access uh, your website and we put something called load balancer between the clients and your servers so first the client will talk to your uh, load balancer and then your load balancer will distribute the traffic to different servers so instead of having only one server to handle all the traffic so now we have n servers and the load balancer will distribute the traffic to one of them so that you know uh, n servers are taking care of uh, the overall traffic at the same time so there are different algorithms to uh, distribute the traffic so the first one is called random so every time if there is uh, some traffic from a user uh, the load balancer will generate a random number and then we mod that random number against the number of servers and then we will know okay which server should load the balancer uh, distribute the traffic to uh, another approach is called round robin basically uh, if we have a uh, traffic then first we uh, distribute the traffic to uh, server 1 and then we have uh, another traffic then we distribute the traffic to server 2 and then we keep going until we reach server n and then we come back and then uh, redistribute the uh, then we distribute the traffic to server 1 again then uh, we distribute the traffic to server 2 so this approach it has one assumption which is uh, the servers we have they share similar capacities which is not always true because we may have some newly purchased servers and these servers may be very powerful and uh, we may also have some uh, servers that were purchased um, two or three years ago. So these old servers won't be as powerful uh, as uh, newly purchased servers. So weighted round robin, the idea it is idea similar to uh, that of round robin. So the difference is uh, uh, when it uh, distributes the traffic to different servers, it also takes uh, the server's capacity into consideration. 
So let's say if server 1 is twice as powerful as server 2, and then the weighted round robin algorithm will distribute uh, twice uh, traffic, uh, will distribute tra uh, twice traffic of server 2 to uh, server 1. And one more approach is called least number of connections. So basically, if server 1 is handling uh, 500 connections, while server 2 is handling only 100 connections. And then, uh, for the new coming uh, traffic, uh, then they will be directed to uh, server 2 to handle uh, these uh, traffics. So, okay, so this is uh, load balancing. So here I have uh, two questions for you. So the first question is, uh, besides load balancing, what other benefits can we obtain if we deploy a load balancer here? The second question is, what is a reverse proxy? So how is reverse proxy different from load balancer? And how is reverse proxy different from a forward proxy? And uh, after introducing load balancer, you may think it is very straightforward to tackle a scalability issue, which is uh, too good to be true. So it is not as easy as uh, we just keep, uh, you know, we, we just uh, distribute our traffic to different uh, servers, then problem solve. So it is not as simple as that. So let me give you one example. If you visit, say, some um, uh, if you do perform some, if you do some shopping online, let's say Amazon.com. Uh, so the first time, uh, you were uh, uh, your your traffic was uh, distributed to server one, and uh, then you add a bunch of uh, books into the shopping cart, okay, and uh, then the then the next time when you uh, access Amazon.com again, then uh, you were uh, distributed to say server 2 and since your uh, session information was saved on server 1 right your shopping cart basically you know which books you have added into the shopping cart so that information is on server 1 so when you were directed to a different server server 2 that doesn't have your session information and then what will happen is you will find that your shopping cart to be empty right we we'll start panic. Say, okay, what happened to my shopping cart? Why uh, I don't have, uh, you know, I had added some books into the shopping cart, but now it is gone. So that is the problem that comes with, uh, uh, you know, when we distribute the traffic to different servers. So how do we solve the problem? So the first uh, solution is uh, we share session data. Uh, among all the servers. So how do we make that happen? So let's say we have some uh, uh, global space so that can hold all the session data. So for example, if we have a, a centralized uh, you know, database, so all the servers can talk to the database to retrieve the session information. Uh, or we have, uh, say, a shared uh, network drive, right? So all the uh, server can uh, retrieve the session information or write session information into that drive. So, uh, in that case, no matter which server uh, you were uh, uh, dis distributed to, and uh, you can always uh, that server can always you know retrieve your session information, which books you have purchased, uh, you have added into the cart. Okay, so that is uh, the first solution. So the second solution is okay. So since the first time. Uh, your traffic was uh, distributed to server 1. Okay, is there some way we can make sure that this, the next time when you access my website, I can make sure that your traffic will be uh, distributed to the same server, so that is server 1. So that since server 1 has your session information, and if I make sure uh, your traffic uh, will be directed, uh, will be uh, Distributed to the same server, right? And then it will ha contain your, uh, you know, uh, session information. So to do that, uh, basically what we do is we can uh, put the server ID into the cookies, so that next time when the user uh, visits your uh, the the website, it will submit the cookie information to the load balancer, 
and then the load balancer can parse the information, then it can find the server ID. You know, okay, last time you were served by server one, so this time I'm gonna uh, uh, distribute your uh, traffic to server one again. But we do it in a more uh, uh, dedicated way. Basically, we don't put the plain uh, text uh, server ID information in the cookies. Instead, we encrypt the server ID information because uh, we don't want the users to know uh, the specific you know configurations uh, behind the load balancer, right? We just want to keep it a black box. We don't want the users to know these uh, details. So that is the first pattern. So the next pattern is um, called caching. So the motivation is uh, um, the motivation is so if we can uh, cache some of the resources or some of the result results uh, in the RAM, and uh, so that we don't need to perform uh, we don't need to retrieve the resource or the results from the disk again. So because reading from RAM is much faster than reading from uh, the disk. So uh, that is uh, that is one motivation. And another motivation is sometimes, uh, maybe, sometimes when if we uh, the computation is uh, quite time consuming, right? So and if this uh, if this part of computation will be requested by different users again and again. So let's say, uh, if if such a read query in some database uh, will take uh, one minute to be finished. And many users are submitting the same query again and again to the database. So instead of so many different users keep hitting the database again and again, we can simply cache the result in the RAM. So that when we when uh, when when uh, next time when a user submits the same query, we can simply just retrieve the result from the RAM. Right? We don't need to hit the database again and again. So. Um, so there is some, uh, we can configure a query cache in a DBMS. So basically, um, the first time when user submits a query, it will take some time to execute, and then it will be the results will be cached. So the next time, uh, if uh, if the same query, if the same uh, read query is executed again, and instead of doing all these computation one more time, the DBMS will just retrieve the. Uh, the cached result. So that is the cache from uh, DBMS. So we also have some uh, specialized system uh, for uh, caching uh, for caching resources. So one of them is called a memcache. So the other one is called Redis. So how is memcache different from Redis? So first of all, both memcached and uh, Redis are distributed, which means instead of deploying them on one machine, we can deploy them uh, on multiple machines. So the, the benefit would be uh, because the amount of RAM on one machine is limited, right? But however, if we have uh, 10 different machines, and then the amount of RAM that can be used for caching, you know, would be 10 times, right? What if you have 100 servers, then it will be 100 times. So. Both systems are distributed, okay. And then memcache, it is a memory caching system. Uh, you can cache string and objects. Uh, Redis can is more because Redis was more uh, recently de developed, so it is um, it can be considered as a superset of memcache. So it is a data structure server. So what do I mean by data structure server? So besides caching, you know, strings and objects, you can cache uh, list, array, uh, sets, uh, sorted sets. What is more is uh, you can uh, perform, say, uh, intersection, uh, uh, union, or you can uh, say, okay, I want to append uh, elements in the list, right? So Redis, whatever you cache, it is not just some simple strings. It will be some it. It is some data structure you can play with. So memcached has some limitation on the key and uh, uh, the, the sizes of key and value. While uh, Redis, uh, you know, as long as your key and value uh, are less than uh, 512 megabyte, uh, you are good. 
So in general, memcache uh, can be used to cache small and static data. Redis can, uh, can be considered as a superset of memcache, so it can be used to cache uh, you know, both small and large static and dynamic data. So the next pattern is about replication. So why do we need replication? So the motivation is to avoid single point of failure. Single point of failure refers to the situation that when one piece of your system is done, and then your entire system will be done. So for example, so here uh, we have uh, the load balancer, okay? Since the users will uh, first uh, you know, talk to the load balancer, then the load balancer will distribute the traffic to different servers. Okay, So what if the load balancer is down? And if, if, if the load balancer uh, gets shut down or it uh, loses its power, then the user can no longer access your website, right? So then to solve, this pro to solve this problem, what we do is, okay, instead of having one load balancer, we can have two load balancers. And they may uh, have uh, you know, different uh, power sources. So if in case one load balancer's power got uh, shut down by accident, then this, the other one can still function. So basically uh, what will happen is say if one load balancer um, is done, and then the other load balancer will, uh, will know that, okay, it is my turn to take the responsibility. So that you know, we can avoid a single point of failure on the load balancer. So now here I have uh, one question for you. How does one load balancer know that it is time to take over the other load balancer? So replication can also be applied to DBMS. So let's say in your website, you have a lot of uh, user data in one uh, database. So what if uh, the database stops uh, functioning, right? And then uh, your website will stop functioning because you know your database is done. So to solve this problem, uh, so if you look at the, uh, the figure on the left, uh, people propose something called master-slave replication. So every time if you have some write queries, it will be directed to the master database. And then the master database will uh, then uh, distribute all these write queries to these slave databases. Okay, so if the master database is done, because we keep uh, distributing the write queries to all the slave databases, right? So the slave database, the slave databases, they will have copies of the, the data from master database. So if uh, master database is done, you just quickly, you know, uh, switch the slave one of the slave databases, and then make it in the master database. Okay. So uh, people also propose something called uh, master master replication. So which is uh, we have a two master nodes so that they can share the write queries. So the write queries will be you know submitted to these to both master databases. And then they will keep talking to each other so that uh, the the write queries will be replicated among them. And then we have a bunch of uh, slave databases. So in the master master replication because uh, you, the write queries will be shared among uh, these uh, to um, master databases and the read queries will be uh, shared by the slave databases. So this is very good if you have a lot of uh, read queries because read queries can be distributed to the slave databases. So that uh, it is not the case that you know uh, you just have one single machine that needs to deal with the uh, a large amount of queries. So instead, uh, it can be distributed to the slave databases. So the next design pattern we would like to talk about would be sharding. So the idea of sharding is uh, we split a large database into smaller shards that can fit into single servers. So let's say if 
as you uh, as you as your user base keeps growing, and you can no longer hold all your user data into one database, right? So then, in that case, you need to uh, split your uh, that database, uh, then put them into two different machines, so that then the uh, so that uh, when you combine the the data uh, on these two machines, then you can have the 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 overall uh, data because you have such a large amount of data that cannot fit on uh, one single machine. So to do that, uh, there are different approaches. So there are some hash based uh, approaches. So that would be if you have a primary key, then you define a hash function. So let's say if you can hash based on the user ID, and let's say if you have uh, you know if you want to have a uh, 10 uh, database servers, servers, right? And then you can just mod the server ID by 10, and then it can be, uh, so if the, if the server ID is one, and then it can be uh, direct, uh, it should be stored in the uh, server one. If it is ID is 22, and then it should be stored on uh, server two. So that is the hash based uh, sharding. And there are also some range-based sharding too. So that that can be say um, uh, uh, users with ID between one and one thousand, then they go to server one, and users with uh, ID between uh, one thousand and one and two thousand, then they go to server two. So in the range-based sharding scenario, it is very important to make sure that uh, the the data that after sharding, there there is no uh, there is no overlap. Okay, you don't want to uh, two users that uh, whose data sits on both server one and server two. And one more approach it would be uh, to have a, a master table. Basically, if you want to know, say, okay, I want to get the data regarding user one, and then there is a mapping. There is a global um, master mapping table so that based on the user ID then it will tell you okay uh, which machine should you go to to retrieve the information but the downside would be every time because you need to query such a global table right and then you know okay where is the data so you know it will take uh, some extra time so in the traditional SQL uh, databases you need to perform the uh, Perform this uh, sharding uh, automatically, but recently in the NoSQL uh, databases such as MongoDB, uh, they have provide uh, auto sharding feature. So basically, you just select okay, I want to perform sharding uh, based on this key, and then uh, the database can automatically, you know, split the, the data onto different machines. So which is uh, very convenient. So to shard data, you know, you can apply a username, say users whose name start with A go to machine one, uh, users uh, whose name start with the B then go to machine two. And so there are different sharding uh, strategies. It can be user ID, it can be location, it can be um, merchant, right? So we have uh, different types of sharding strategies. So now here are my questions. So this time I have a little bit uh, more uh, questions. So the first one is how should we choose the sharding strategy? The second one is how does Facebook initially shard their uh, database? The third one is um, so now since uh, we have uh, instead of having one uh, big database, we have uh, you know several databases. So how do we if you if so say if you have a new user and now you want to generate a user ID for the new user right so how do you generate a self increment user IDs because you want to make sure that you're able to generate user ID and you want to make sure that say okay you generate one user ID on one machine on one database and you generate another one on a different database you want to make sure that there's no conflict these two users they don't share the same user ID. So how should we make it that happen? Uh, one more question would be, 
so say initially all your data cannot fit uh, on one machine so you split the data you now your data sits on two machines okay so now as you keep uh, as you keep your website becomes more and more popular right and uh, two machines cannot hold your uh, entire data set your, your database okay so how would you perform a resharding so that uh, you know so you can minimize the number of because you need to migrate data from one server to a different server right how do you minimize the migration so one more design pattern would be queue message queue so the idea is uh, because in most of in, in a lot of the cases we we focus on the synchronized uh, you know tasks but sometimes there are some very uh, some time consuming tasks so the idea is we just make them uh, asynchronized so let's say if we get some request from the user uh, and because we know that uh, this uh, to uh, fulfill this request uh, you know we take they will take a long time so that instead of uh, keeping the user waiting what we do is we just uh, put the drop into the message queue right and then we have a bunch of uh, you know uh, machines they will retrieve the job from the queue and once <coughs> once the uh, once the job is finished then you know we are send a notification to the user and then we we'll notify them say okay now uh, this job is done right so in the mean in the meantime so the idea is because this drop they're very time consuming so we don't want to keep the users keep waiting right but instead once it is done we are you know notify the, the users okay so so far we have covered uh, you know different patterns for um, under the category of uh, you know horizontal scaling right so then when we meet in the class we will discuss some uh, you know specific cases some uh, you know uh, real world cases so the first one would be if we are about to build a say UIL uh, shortening services okay so then how would you design the system so how would you apply all the design patterns that uh, we just covered uh, in this uh, class and the second one is um, we know Twitter is a very popular uh, microblog service okay so on Twitter how the, so on Twitter's backend how does Twitter design uh, it is system so that every time when we uh, perform a search right so that we how, how do Twitter design the system so that it can return the search result to us very quickly and uh, we every time we load the your home run, uh on Twitter, right? So what happens at the backend? How would you, how would you design the system to make sure that a user can load the you know, uh, his or hers timeline uh, very quickly? Okay, so that's all for today, uh, and uh, I look forward to see you in the class.